So I'm so glad that we're not just slipping into Christmas, that the Advent kind of is completed today. And, and it isn't complete without this um, amazing story of this young teenager who finds herself in this incredibly difficult situation. Um, social embarrassment, confusion, um, and not really knowing how her family and how our society is going to deal with this. And it's very interesting that in the midst of that kind of, uh, that question and that crisis, that the invitation is to connect with someone older. And, and this wonderful connection with Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. And, and so she goes into a kind of retreat to prepare for this birth. And, and, and Elizabeth is also like Hannah, the mother of Samuel, is somebody who couldn't have children. She's an old lady. But, but she epitomizes the kind of wise <coughs> old crone, a kind of, you know, a mystical, uh, almost divine, the divine presence in somebody who has lived deeply. And so this is, these two women are going to revolutionize the world. And there is the story that when they, when they greet each other, when she goes on this retreat to meet with Elizabeth, and as confused as she was, that the, the little babies inside their womb leap for joy. There's a kind of, almost a kind of visceral connection that's going on. And, and the revolution is that the temple that we read about that's being built for the place of God, the temple which has been around for thousands of years in Jerusalem is now going to be replaced by Mary. Mary becomes the temple. God's living among us is going to move out of a building into flesh and blood. And, and so the revolution that Elizabeth and Mary are bringing about, this enormous kind of radical transformation of the way we think about um, how God is and where God lives and how God is present um, and how God is also in the question. You know, I mean, if you're a teenager and you find yourself pregnant and you're not quite sure what that means or what that does, I mean, that's, that opens up enormous crises and how you deal with that and how you trust older people. You go and you talk to somebody about it and you get wisdom and you get advice and you get a kind of uh, support system. And then, you know, faith is moving in the dark. Faith is, is moving into that place that you don't fully get your head around. And then it's going to be okay. This week, um, what's, what I love about the Advent theme and the lighting of the candles in the darkness, this week, the 21st of December, is the darkest day. Right? It's like the sun has disappeared. And for our ancestors, that, that moment when it looked as if the sun was disappearing, the light that it gave us life is disappearing, um, that was celebrated with all sorts of uh, rituals and traditions. Uh, there is a German legend uh, that in, the, in those darkest days that the ice caps of the North Pole would come down and freeze all of life as we know it. And there would only be a, a young boy and a young girl that would survive. And they would be hidden inside the trunk of an evergreen tree until, until this ice age, this work. It's almost like the, the Noah story, the flood, where everything is destroyed. And, and they and they survive in the, in the trunks of the of evergreen tree, and then the spring comes and the meadow grows, and the young people come out of the trunks, and they make life, and life goes on. And that comes from the tradition of these, the darkest day. In Ireland, I've talked a lot about this place that I love called Newgrange, which is a 5,000-year-old temple. It took 50 years to build. And what, what it is, it looks like a big pile, it looks like a mountain of little stones. But it's a chamber that you go in, it's almost that you enter into the womb that's about 100 feet long. You have to kind of, you, you move between these stones, and then you come into a chamber that holds about 50 people. And it's all beautifully decorated with spirals and lozen shapes. And this, um, what's amazing about this place is on the 21st of December, which is the shortest day, or the longest day, 
The sun, as the sun rises, comes down that chamber and lights up. Comes down that passageway, and it's like the the fertility of the earth. And it, it's kind of it, I call it a temple because we we don't really know what what went on there. I remember talking uh, to the woman who, who was the director. She ran it for 25 years, and she said, you know, I've seen every everything on top of this. There were people in feathers and dancing and rattling and and and, and he said, we don't know what what the rituals were about this place, but it's. It was about the fertility, the connection of the sun with the earth that brought life. Right? And so the Mary story is like that in a way. I want us to think about that. That this is a very ancient story that is about the connection between the sun and life and fear. The fear of dying, the fear of not having enough to eat, the fear. And that somehow the story of Mary. Um, in her saying, uh, let it be, um, saying to Gabriel, uh, let it be according to your word, is a, way, is a kind of way in which um, you know, she moves through her fear and despair into life and light. And there is, um, there is this tradition around Mary. They, the Greek church, they, they talk about Mary being Theotokos, the bearer of God. There's wonderful iconography of Mary with, with Jesus. And often those, those images are called Theotokos, the bearer of God. And um, C.H. Dodd, one of the New Testament theologians, described faith once as an act which is the negation of all activity, a moment of passivity out of which the strength of action comes because in it God acts. Mary's response to the angel Gabriel, let it be to me according to your word, becomes a kind of model of faith and trust in God's action in our lives. And Gabriel, the word Gabriel means the hero of God. So Mary also becomes the hero of God. Um, there's a book, you know, some of you have read that wonderful book by Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces. And I quote from that book, it is not society that is to guide and save the creative hero, but precisely the reverse. And so every one of us shares the supreme ordeal, carries the cross of the Redeemer, not in the bright moments of his tribe's or her tribe's greatest victories, but in the silence of his personal despair. I'll read that again, it's very powerful. It is not society that is to guide and save the creative hero, but precisely the reverse. And so every one of us shares the supreme ordeal, carries the cross of the Redeemer, not in the bright moments of his or her tribe's greatest victories, but in the silence of his personal despair. And the, and the icon of Mary, it's interesting as the New Testament writers weave in these amazing stories. For instance, in Luke uh, or in Matthew, there is this, um, I remember as a kid, you used to find this very strange, the whole begets, you know, this person begat, this person, what, what on earth is that all about? And it's something like 40 generations or something. Um, but it's interesting, in those, be those are all gods. These are all, this is the lineage of, of, of Jesus, right? But in, the, in those guys, there are five women who are all outsiders and who save Israel, including Mary. And, and what the gospel writers are doing, they're taking this tradition that, um, you know, in a way it kind of saves us from the idea as well, well, we're in this club and we have it all right. Well, guess what? In the history of Israel, that hasn't been the case. That often we got it wrong, and it was outsiders, and it was women who saved the day. And that God used them. So Mary is in the, in the tradition of these amazing, uh, controversial uh, women um, that God uses to bring about salvation and healing in the world. And, and in a way, it's, it's a kind of in the midst of all that patriarchal oppression, you have this story, which is quite amazing. 
that, that you know, uh, we, this person begat this person, this person. But in the middle of that, God is in action in the feminine and in the people who are on, on the margins. And also in the, in the gospel traditions, we get Mary, you know, there is a prophecy as she takes the baby Jesus to the temple, um, there is a prophecy that the sword will pierce her own soul also. That in a way, it's not just Jesus who will be taken to the cross, but Mary will too, right? And this, in the, back to the Celtic tradition, there is in the Celtic tradition, the Roman tradition is that Peter, uh, found, he is the founder of the church with the keys, you know, St. Peter's. We have the keys, the authority, and I give you the authority. Jesus is giving him, this is how the church was formed. Celtic church, it, it's a very, the, very different tradition of how the church started. The Celtic church said the church formed when Jesus is on the cross and he says to Mary, Mary, um, my son, uh, from Mary to John, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. So Mary and John are the two people left at the foot of the cross. And the whole idea is, and that's the moment the church is created in that relationship. It's a very different model of church. It's not about control and authority. It's about kind of redemptive suffering and people who are just still present in the midst of horror and desolation and despair. The hero. Back to that idea. Um, so in Mary, there is, um, as we kind of think about Mary, and that's why it's so good that we do this this morning, because it would have been sad just to miss this part of the story. And we just go to Christmas, right? But in the midst of the Christmas story, you have that confusion and trust. You have the story um, that we will read about um, exile, that they Mary gives birth and then has to flee to Egypt. So we're now talking about refugees and the uncertainty of what that means. And this, and this is in the heart of the story today. And then, um, then there's the whole story of how Mary deals with, as this son grows up and is misunderstood, how she deals with that as a parent. And then there, there she is at the foot of the cross. And then she's also part of the community of, re of resurrection, that she's present also when the church um, begins to kind of connect all the dots and move into this new reality of how God is with us in a different way and that the temple is gone but guess what the temple isn't gone um, so we have much to celebrate today this last Sunday about that the fusion of heaven and earth becomes incarnate through Mary of Nazareth as the warmth of the love of God enkindles in the people of God again like this candle as the light of a new day draws us into the life of Christ as we journey with Mary, our great hero, towards Bethlehem, pregnant with hope and full of joy. Uh -huh.